Good morning, church. Welcome to Bridgetown Church of Christ. Uh, I'm excited this morning. I'm just coming back from ICON, the International Conference on Mission Missions. It happened in Columbus this last weekend. You know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 6,000 missionaries and ministry leaders came together to uh, be encouraged and to share what God's doing around the world. And I'm happy to report God's on the move. You know, he's uh, working in South Africa and West Africa and the Ukraine. Hundreds and thousands of people, or hundreds, yeah, and thousands of people are coming to Christ, even in the middle of what's going on over there. Um, uh, in in uh, Western Europe, in South America, the Dominican Republic, all over the world, God is moving. And I'm happy to say he's moving here as well in our city in Cincinnati. He's doing, doing great things. So we have a lot to celebrate, a lot to praise him for. Um, so... I just want to tell you one story about a gentleman from, he's a pastor from, oh, I just lost the country, an African country, I forgot what it was, Sierra Leone, and he's telling us how he's been arrested five times for the sake of the gospel, and one of those times, um, he was stuck in a, a shipping container, imagine it being a shipping container in, in uh, West Africa, it's pretty warm there, right? Um, for 24 hours, they intended to kill him. They told him that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna kill you. But he was in there, and he turned to scripture and like what he knew, and like what Paul did when he was in prison. He just sang, he sang, and he sang. He sang for like 23 hours. I think he said, just worshiping God. And the whole time they're beating on the container, telling him, "Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! You're being annoying." Whatever. He wouldn't. And uh, the commander came out, opened the door, and came, brought him out, and said, "You're the boldest person I've ever met. What makes you so bold?" <laughs> And he had a chance to share Christ with that commander, and fast forward two or three months, and he baptized him. <laughs> and so, you know, God's on the move. So, amen. So, this morning, I just want to let you think about, you know, we're, we're not an entity in and of ourselves. We're part of a, a movement that's happening all across the world, right? So, this morning, uh, over in the uh, other time zones in Europe and such, you know, church has been happening. So, we're just going to join with the believers that have already been worshiping and praising God this morning. So... Um, this morning, if you would please stand with us, um, the band's light, so I need you to sing loud. Uh, so as we, uh, as we worship, just raise your hallelujah, whatever you have to be thankful for, you have to praise the Lord for, sing it out loud. Before we do that, take just a second and say hi to a couple people around you, and we'll get started. Oh 
Well, welcome to Bridgetown Church of Christ. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we are glad that you're with us today. Um, if you're here in person and you haven't already grabbed a communion packet, they're at the back there. We have uh, gluten-free, um, as well as, I guess, regular, you would call it. So, I don't know if that's what you call it. Um, today, right after church, uh, Bridgetown Kids is having their parfaits, pals, and pizza. I got it right. I rehearsed that about 16 times. So it's an outreach of reach event. Uh, that's taking place in the fellowship hall. So your kiddos were given invitations last week to give out at school or to give out where they were trick-or-treating. And so they did a great job of uh, inviting their friends to this great event. So let's give the kids a hand for that. Awesome. So just uh, in just a few moments, uh, Nathan is going to come and unpack Revelation chapter 9. Uh, so if you have your Bible journal, uh, you can turn to page 34. That's where that is. And if you don't have one and you'd like one, there are some at the back of the room. Uh, but before we get into that, we want to talk real quick about our next church-wide service opportunity. Uh, last week, Kyle shared that our next, our 2022-2023 vision event uh, is going to be serving our neighborhood uh, ministry partner, Western Hills Church of Christ in Price Hill. Uh, so we're going to be preparing their fellowship hall for a paint job, doing a deep cleaning um, in other areas of their facility. So check out this video from lead pastor Dan Lang with more details on this project. Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor. I'm thankful to be a neighbor of Bridgetown Church of Christ. Hi, I'm Dan Lang, the lead minister of Western Hills Church of Christ. We are a diverse transitioning urban church called to be a light in a changing neighborhood. Each Sunday, we provide services in three different languages. And we've realized that so many of our neighbors feel hopeless. I mean, they really feel stuck in poverty, racial inequities, broken lives and families, addictions, mental health challenges, and spiritual despair. And so our mission is to provide a foundation of hope and help people build new lives in Christ, primarily through relational discipling. And here's how you can help. When you were remodeling your building a few years ago, we provided a meeting place for some of your ministries. And now we're thankful for your willingness to come and serve us. You know, we don't have the means to do a significant remodeling at this time, but you can help us spruce up the facilities that we have. Your leadership team is mobilizing your church to prepare our fellowship hall for painting and then provide some needed deep cleaning to make our building more aesthetically appealing. And your manpower will be such a blessing to us. Our fellowship hall is a primary gathering place for meal functions and group meetings and ministry projects, youth and children's activities, training seminars, narcotic recovery groups meet here, and much more. So thank you for jumping in to give it a fresh look. Now, the nature of these projects, they're designed for nearly everyone to be involved. All ages or abilities can participate. 
You and your crew can sign up to serve in three-hour shifts on Friday and Saturday, November 25th and 26th from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. or two-hour shifts on Sunday, November 27th from 2 to 6 p.m. And I just think it's amazing that when many Americans are focused on Black Friday bargain shopping or holiday gatherings, you're choosing to give yourself for just a few hours to serve the Lord and your neighbors. You obviously love God and love your neighbors. You can find details and sign up information at bridgetownchurch.com slash net. On behalf of the Western Hills Church family, we humbly thank you for your ministry to us. Well, good morning again, and thank you for joining us at BCC. As Mike mentioned, we're about a fourth of the way into our 2022 mission. As a church, we plan to invest $100,000 and 2,500 service hours into 10 community organizations by the end of July of 2023. And we're off to a really good start. In August, we partnered with Block Ministries in Price Hill. We painted their community art building, 66 people from our church served 288 hours, and when we were done, it looked great. Since then, hundreds of kids from the community have participated in pottery and dance programs facilitated by Block Ministries in the building that we painted. And so we are now a part of Block's mission to share hope in brokenness. Then in October, we partnered with Young Life to host a prayer and pancake breakfast. 60 of our partners prayed for Bridgetown Middle School on a Sunday right after church. Another 40 came to eat pancakes and pray with leaders of Young Life. BCC has received such positive feedback from them. And again, we invested 122 hours into our community. As you saw in the video, our next partnership is with Western Hills Church of Christ. And I love that our team chose to partner with another local church. Too often churches can act like they're in competition with one another instead of a part of the same team. We're in this together and I look forward to serving with you the weekend after Thanksgiving. As Dan mentioned, you can sign up for the Friday shift, Saturday shift, Sunday shift, and if you're a partner of BCC or just visiting today and say, hey, I think I'd like to do that, you're welcome to participate with us. If you have a willing heart, we will find a job for you. It's great to be on our way, but we still have over 2,000 hours to invest if we're going to reach our goal of 2,500 service hours. As for the money, we have that set aside. All the funds are already earmarked in our checking account. One of the great things about this church is we are a debt-free church, and by being a debt-free church, we're able to invest in the community that we're a part of in significant ways, which is great. So as we enter the official holiday season, I just want to ask you up front, to continue to be faithful with your giving. Uh, We were talking about this at the men's ministry small group on Wednesday night. It's hard. The price of everything is going up. But in the midst of it, I encourage you to tighten your budget in other areas and not to uh, skimp on your giving to God. When we put God's kingdom first, he continues to be faithful to us. And we've seen that on so many different levels, not just with our finances. We see it all the time here at BCC as a church. We prayed hard for Bridget Rothhouse. She was very, very ill. She was given a very small percentage chance to live. She was on dialysis and a ventilator. And I'm happy to um, just to let you know that as of this morning, she is she is home and she's healing very, very well, which is amazing. Um, The doctor I was visiting with Bridget last week, and she told me the doctor said you are quote a walking miracle end quote. And it's amazing. The same is true for Jamie Daniels. As a church, we've prayed for Jamie since June. She's finally home and she's healing. She's stronger than ever, which is great. We can give God a hand for that. Um, Jamie, I know you're with us online, and I know you'll be here in person as soon as you can, but they are putting together a plan to fight the cancer, and we are learning together as a church that nothing is impossible with God. I'm so thankful that we serve a God who cares about what's going on in our lives. And so I want to pray right now, and um, I also wanted to pass on a thank you, the Hardings and the Hartungs, their mom, Linda, who we prayed a lot for. Um, She has gone to be with the Lord as of last Sunday, and 
so she's now in that great cloud of witnesses, and they just wanted to pass on gratitude for all of the cards and all of the love that they received as a church. So let's just pray and offer God a prayer of praise this morning. Yeah. Yeah, Chris, go ahead. Yes. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, great. Oh, that's great. Thank you. So let me, um, for those online, because I know you can't hear. So Chris and Phil are a part of our church, and Phil was in an awful car accident in, when was it, Chris? September 16th, and he has been in the hospital since then in a coma, and he was just moved, and he opened his eyes for the first time, which is amazing. So um, God is starting to do some healing there as well. Thank you, Chris, for, or, for sharing that with us. So let's just have a moment of prayer right now. God, um, we want to thank you for your goodness, and we want to thank you for showing us your goodness at BCC. Thank you for putting us into a position as a church where we're able to serve other people, And we're able to love on organizations like Block and Western Hills and Young Life. Thank you for filling our cup to overflowing so that our cup can overflow and bless others. Thank you for welcoming Linda home into the great cloud of witnesses. We can only imagine what she is experiencing this morning as she is worshiping you in a body that's completely healed. God, thank you for allowing Jamie and Bridget to uh, return to their homes. Thank you for allowing Phil to open his eyes. And God, we just lift him up to you and ask you to continue to bring him healing and to uh, allow the same to be said of him that's been said of Bridget, that he is a walking miracle, God. Um, We know that you can defy all odds. We know that nothing is impossible for you. We know, God, that you are good, and we thank you for your faithfulness to us. May we be faithful in return. Challenge us and encourage us today through your word, God, Give us the wisdom and the heart and the desire to remain faithful. It's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Um, Thank you. And Chris, thanks for sharing. It's just, uh, I, I, uh, you know, um, we often get a front row seat to see people um, going through some really tough stuff, but we also get a front row seat to see God doing some really amazing stuff, and I, I love sharing that with you all as a church family, and it's great to be on this journey with you. We're going to jump into Revelation chapter 9, and we are in the thick of it now. I was telling Mike this morning, one of our elders, that I've been preaching for almost 20 years, and this is probably the hardest message I've ever put together, and I got a feeling I might say that several times over the next few weeks. Uh, Revelation chapters 1 through about about 6 are pretty easy to understand. Revelation chapter 19 through 21, 22, they're pretty easy to apply to our lives today. But when we get into the middle of the book of Revelation, it is very, very difficult. And for that reason, a lot of Christians, a lot of believers, never read the book of Revelation. Or if they do read the book of Revelation, they skim through the book and say, I have no idea what any of this is talking about. But we've seen together that Revelation reveals Jesus. It's the last book of the Bible, and it's a fitting in to the entire Bible, and it reveals for us Jesus. John is taken up, and he's given a vision of what is happening in heaven and what is happening on earth now at his time in 90 AD. This vision is not about faraway things that are going to happen in the distant future. It's about the current realities of spirituality, and it's both encouraging, and it's also a bit on the frightening side. It's encouraging to remember that God sits on his throne atop of all of the chaos of life. It's encouraging to know that Jesus is walking among his churches, that he walks among the church today to see what is happening. It's encouraging to be reminded that the Old Testament promises are fulfilled in the New Testament church. It's encouraging to hear Jesus and to know that the prayers of the saints are being heard. In fact, history is moving forward today because the saints are praying and those prayers are being poured out in heaven. But at the same time, the book of Revelation is scary and it's frightening because it holds no punches. Things are not getting better. The church will face persecution. In fact, we saw in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 that the two churches that are the most faithful, the two churches that have nothing negative 
said against them, they are the two churches that will soon face the most difficulty. The difficulty of following God now gets put on full display as the seven seals are broken, the seven trumpets are blown, the seven bulls are poured out. And remember, we're in a cycle here, and we're going to see the same basic story repeated multiple times, I think, because we have a hard time getting it. We have a hard time understanding it. And so it's shown to us from multiple different angles. We worked our way through the seven seals and through the first four trumpets. The first trumpet brought hail and fire. This reminds us that economic hardships will face Christians. Inflation, as we saw in the breaking of one of the seals, is to be expected. The people who can afford the fine wine, they keep spending more. And yet the people who are in poverty keep getting poorer. And it's just a a reminder that's tucked into the book of Revelation that fine silver and china are never promised to faithful followers of God. The idea that if you follow Jesus, you'll have everything you ever want is not an idea that we get from the New Testament scripture. It's an idea that comes from somewhere else. The second trumpet was reminiscent of the first plague on Egypt. Its blast reminds us that the sea will be destroyed in various ways. Natural disasters will take out ships People will pollute the ocean. God will allow this destruction. See, the people of God and God's creation, we are really good at destroying God's creation. So the created destroy the creation of God. And we find new ways to do this every single day, to destroy the beautiful earth that God has given us. Which brings us to the third trumpet. At its sound, more water is made bitter and more people die from polluted water. To this day, 50% of the world does not have clean drinking water. And the fourth trumpet reminds us that everything is actually pretty dark. There is a real sense in which the world is getting darker as creation moans under the weight of sin and longs for Jesus to return soon. It could be a lot to take in. The seals and the trumpets, they remind us of God's judgment. Exodus portrays the ten plagues as God's judgment on Egypt and as God's judgment upon Pharaoh and the people who worship false gods. Each plague is intended to get the Egyptians and Pharaoh to turn and to repent, but that's not what happened. Instead, their hearts continue to be growing harder and harder. And in these visions, John is inviting us to see the current troubles in our world as God's judgment on human sin. The Apostle Paul makes this same point in Romans 1. He says this, The wrath of God is presently, right now, being poured out, being revealed from heaven against the godless and the wickedness of men who suppress the truth about God by their wickedness. The ten plagues were intended to get Pharaoh to repent of his opposition to God. And John is making it clear that the troubles in our present world are intended to remind us of our need for God. Hear me say this. Every trial is an opportunity for Christians and non-Christians alike to realize their need for God. Every trial is an opportunity for us to realize our need to rely upon God. Trials can lead people to repent. Trials can lead people to turn closer to God. Jen Hawk, who leads our care ministry, often says every single person who has a trial will have one of two things happen. They will either grow closer to God through the trial or they will walk further away from God. Trials present us with an opportunity. And when we get this, the world's suffering actually becomes an act of God's mercy toward sinners. Let me say that again. Because I think it's a revolutionary thought. John is writing to seven churches who are suffering. And they want to know why are we suffering. And the answer is given in the form of a vision. Suffering is tied to the judgment of God. And God's judgment is not a bad thing when it's rightly understood. God's judgment is an opportunity for people to repent and accept the mercy of God. 
This is, this is explained throughout the Bible, and it really comes to a head in Revelation chapter 9. John's going to pump on the brakes. He took six verses in Revelation chapter 8 to show us four trumpets, and now he's going to take an entire chapter to show us the next two. The final two trumpets he calls woes. The final three trumpets are actually the three woes. So let's jump in with the fifth trumpet, starting in verse 1 of chapter 9. I'm going to read the first 13 verses. Just follow along with me in your journal if you have it. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given a key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And he opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with smoke from the shaft. And then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of a scorpions of the earth, and they were told not to harm the ground of the earth or any green plant or tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death, and they will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces. Their hair was like a woman's hair. Their teeth was like lion's teeth. They had had breastplates like the breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots and horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have a king over them, and the angel of the bottomless pit, his name in Hebrew is Abdomen, and in Greek is Apollyon. We've got a Greek name and a Hebrew name. We'll talk about those in a minute. And this first woe has past, behold, two woes are still to come. Now, if you're like me, when I read this passage of scripture, I think, okay, I know why it's called woes, because we're all saying, whoa, what is going on here? It is a, it is a confusing and difficult passage of scripture. Let's zoom out, and then we'll zoom back in, and we'll talk about the symbolism in a minute. Remember, Revelation is not intended to be taken literally. God uses symbolism to show us what is happening in the world. Real people in John's day in 90 AD were experiencing real trials and God really wanted them to know the truth. The book is not written about distant future events. It's written about current realities. The churches are experiencing actual trials and God is helping them to see through this vision what is happening behind the scenes. God is helping common Christians to understand their suffering. And in chapter 9, God uses the fifth trumpet to reveal the current sting of of sin. God uses a fifth trumpet to reveal the current sting of sin. I would jot that down. Divine judgment is often manifest through evil and destructive forces, and we see in Revelation 9 that evil is always self-destructive. Evil is always inviting other people to be involved in the self-destruction. Bad company corrupts good character, and evil always wants others to be involved as an audience member and preferably as a participant. We see this very practically in our influence of bad friends. Have you ever noticed that it's the people in your life that try to pull you away from God that always want to spend time with you? Have you ever noticed that it's the friend who says, go ahead and have one more drink, what could it hurt, that always invites you over to their house? Why is that? It's because evil is self-destructive and it's constantly moving us away from God. And what boggles the mind in this passage is that God is working through all of this. It's an angel of God, or at least an angel who is instructed by God, who blows the trumpet, which causes the star to fall, which which causes the pit to open. Remember, this is symbolic. John is not suggesting there's an actual hidden bottomless pit somewhere on the earth's surface. He's showing us that there are actual evil and destructive forces that are moving on the earth. Evil demons are like locusts, and they are destroying life. But unlike locusts that attack green grass and plants, these evil demons are harming people. I would circle power like the power of scorpions 
scorpions in verse 3. Power like the power of scorpions. These evil forces have a powerful and they have a painful sting. Who is it that they sting? Verse 4, those who do not have the mark of God. There's a lot of symbolism going on here, especially in verses 7 through 10, which describe these grotesque creatures. But I want you to notice in verse 3 and 5 and 10, they have the scorpion's sting. It's mentioned three times in this passage. And when we don't get lost in the details, we're able to see that God is using the pain of sin in the life of unbelievers to try to get them to turn to him. The vision reminds the people in the seven churches that, man, you're going to see some crazy stuff. You're going to see people destroying their lives. You're going to see people who are given to sin and their life is falling apart to the point they want to die. God will allow awful and distorted evil forces to roam across the earth like a plague of locusts. And these dark forces will have positions of power. At times they will look like humans, verse 7. Other times they will use fierce and destructive forces like the jaw of a lion, verse 8. All the while they will be controlled by an evil king whose name is destruction and destroyer. That's what those Hebrew and Greek words mean. Destruction and destroyer. It's Satan who is using his army to destruct and to destroy lives. They will encourage those who are not marked by the seal of God to sin. They will convince unbelievers that freedom is found in lawlessness, but the truth is what is found in walking away from God is pain. There is destruction. There is destroyed relationships. And when we don't get lost in the imagery, we're able to step back and say, I have seen this sort of thing before. How many of us know people who experience great pain like the sting of a scorpion because of sin in their lives? Husbands are lured by demons to follow the destructor and the destroyer and they have affairs and it ruins their entire family, their relationship with their kids and their parents. What looks like pleasure quickly turns to pain. Young men and women are convinced that there is freedom to be found in the needle until it punctures the vein like a scorpion sting. Those who are enticed by quick, quick and easy money are lured into gambling until they have nothing left and they want to die, but they can't die. And instead they have to face their family with the shame of loss. We have seen it before and on our best days we wonder, where is God in the midst of this? And the fifth trumpet reminds us, he's right there. He's working Thankfully, God sets limits on the intensity and the duration of the destruction. God shows mercy, and this is really important to see, even to those who are not following him. God knows his own. They are marked with the Holy Spirit, but God's attitude is not to hell with everyone else. God allows these evil forces to run amok, but he is waiting on people to feel the power of sting, uh, the power of the sting of sin to the point that they will turn to him. God is watching as pain ruins lives, as people follow the destroyer, and he's waiting, hoping that these people will sense the judgment that is coming and turn to him. He's setting limits. He's limiting intensity. He, he doesn't extend the lifespan of the locust. The locust would live for five months. God could extend the lifespan, but he chooses not to do that. Why? Why would God allow these beasts to be set free on the earth? Why would God limit their power? What is the purpose in all of this? The answer is given when the sixth trumpet is blown. Let's pick up in verse 13. And then the sixth angel blew his trumpet... And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. And the number of the mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. Can I just pause right here and say this is uh, a little bit of humor, I think, inserted in the midst of this vision. And so John says he sees uh, two times 10,000 times 10,000. If you're good at math, that's two million. So he sees two million horse riders who are ready to come. But 
But then notice that he adds, I heard their number. He just lets us know, I didn't actually count all of them. I just heard somebody say that there were two million. And we're like, okay, John, we'll give you that one. You didn't count them all. So he's got this weird vision going on. He says, I heard there were two million of them. I don't know for sure. I didn't actually count them. But that's what I heard. There was a whole bunch of them. Verse 17, and this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode on them. They wore breastplates, the collar of fire and sapphire and sulfur. The heads of the horses were like lion's heads and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouth. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like that of a serpent with heads and by the means of them they wound. So they got like a lion's head on a horse's body with a snake coming out for the tail with a snake's head on the end. Try to draw it this week and send me a picture. I don't know. The rest of mankind Mankind, verse 20, who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. They did not repent of their murders or their sorceries, of their sexual immoralities or of their thefts. There's a lot going on here, and I'll come back and break it down in just a minute, but let me start really high level with you. God uses the sixth trumpet to show that repentance is ultimately the goal. Repentance is ultimately the goal. God does this by playing off of the greatest fear of those living in the seven churches at the time. What was the greatest fear of somebody living in Western Roman Empire at this time? It was invasion from the Parthenian army. And while the imagery in verses 13 through 19 doesn't make a lot of sense to us, It would have been very clear to those first readers that he was referencing the Parthenians who lived just across the Euphrates River. John wrote at a time when the two most powerful empires in the entire world were separated by a river. They were separated by a body of water and the Parthenians were the the archival enemies of Rome and they feared Rome, feared the Parthenians because of their boldness in battle. And in this vision, God is essentially saying, hey, you should have some level of fear because if I want, I can use the Parthenian army to bring about my judgment. God did that in the past, right? In the Old Testament, God used the Assyrians. God used the Babylonians. God used the Persians. He he never approved of their evil ways. He never approved of their false gods, but he used them to bring about his purposes. God is always the one holding back evil invaders in our lives. Our greatest fears do not become reality because of God's grace. As for the horses, the fire, the brimstone, the lion's heads, the serpent tails, all of that, it's symbolic. And it's meant to show us judgment. A third of the world's population dies. It's an unparalleled catastrophe, which reminds us of the red horse of war that came out when one of the seven seals was broken. As for the number, it's the greatest army ever seen. It's an army that has more than 700,000 fighters in it today than the U.S. military has. The point is not the number. The point is the fear. God uses the paranoid fear of the part Athenians to elevate how he will judge. God does what he wants, when he wants, without asking the permission of anyone else. God doesn't tell us why, but verses, uh, God does though tell us why in verses 20 and 21, and the key word is repentance. Shockingly, and this is where you're supposed to, we get so lost in all the imagery here that we miss what we're supposed to actually see. When we read Revelation 9, what's supposed to shock us, what's supposed to make us say, what is happening right now is the fact that these people don't repent. That's why it's so shocking. How in the world can they live right across the river, that's where they're located, from the greatest army besides the Roman army that's about to invade them? How can they live right there and not repent? In the face of such suffering, we would assume, of course, they would turn to God. But remember, Pharaoh didn't. And I would say that many people today still don't repent. They lived on the doorstep of their greatest enemy in the shadow of a massive empire that could invade. 
And yet they just went about their days oblivious to what was happening. They continued to worship cultural gods. They kept worshiping false idols. They kept moving away from God and involving themselves in sexual immorality. The Romans refused to repent. Many refused to turn from their false values to the creator. It still happens. I know people who have faced awful things in their life. And have been given the opportunity to repent and turn to God. And yet they refuse to do so. There is an arrogance in humanity that allows us to live right across the river from our greatest enemy. And say, you know what? I don't think I really need God in my life. And maybe that's where you're at today. Your greatest fear may not be an invading army, but it could be the loss of your health, the running out of your wealth, the ending of a relationship. You may be harboring a sin, a sin that is not murder, but maybe hatred. You could be controlled by a hatred for an ex-husband or an ex-wife. You may not be into sorcery, but you never miss your daily horoscope. You use crystals to heal and dream catchers to protect your sleep. You may not be into sexual immorality, morality. You're not sleeping around, but you do not go 24 hours without watching pornography. How about thieving? You've never robbed a bank, but you can't remember the last time you put in an honest week's work. You do as little as possible and demand as much as possible in return. For all that has supposedly changed over the last 2,000 years, the world is remarkably the same. We ignore God's urging to repent. When there's sin and the pain of sin in our lives, we keep walking down the paths of idolatry and immorality, even when we are clearly and unmistakably warned by God. And if that's you, if that's where you're at, I want to urge you to wake up. John is not beyond using fear to drive us to repentance. And I'm not trying to do that today, but I want to be faithful to what the Bible says. Somebody asked me recently, why do we preach straight through the Bible? And the answer is right here, because it forces us to face things that we don't always want to deal with. This passage reminds us that we should think twice before flirting with compromise. Everything will eventually succumb to the judgment of God. So what do we have our faith in? Do we have our faith in the river that separates us from our fears? Do we have our faith in the ability to dodge the sting of the scorpion of sin? We have to recognize that God is not absent in times of hardship. Far from it. He's in control. And the cross testifies that God loves the world so much that he's able and willing to step into our pain and deliver us from it. Even today, God God is not simply waiting for Christ's return. It's not like Jesus rose to heaven and God just sitting on his throne now, like twiddling his thumbs, just, just waiting on the second coming. That's not what's happening. He's sending judgment with the goal of repentance. God wants people to turn from a path that is paved by the one who destroys our lives to a path of serving others and loving God that is paved by Jesus who came and died on the cross for us. Repentance is not just a message for the world. It's a message for all of us, especially those of us who have become too comfortable with the world's values. In the end, when we strip back all of the symbolism of the images in Revelation, we see two different forms of rule. The vision in Revelation 4 through 5 shows the rightly ordered throne room of God in which the Creator and the Lamb are worshipped by people who are faithful to God. In Revelation 9, we see grotesque creatures who are affecting creation and stinging people with pain. As for the winged creatures who are in the throne room of God, they each have their own distinct faces. And it is, so, it is not so with the beasts who have teeth like lions and scales like scorpions that are going about on the earth. And then there's the elders around the throne room who are casting down their crowns and they're singing to God in perfect harmony, but not with the locusts. They are wearing the crowns and they are making clamoring noises as they go into battle. Revelation shows us in a vivid and sometimes shocking way the clash of two worlds. 
In great depiction, the last book of the Bible reminds us that Jesus wins, but Jesus doesn't win by fighting as we think. There's no actual battle scene in the book of Revelation. We've talked about this. We're going to see it. When all the heavenly armies finally gather in Revelation chapter 19, what is it that they actually do? Nothing. All the action belongs to Christ, and the only weapon he needs is his words. The sword in his mouth. I know this message has been a message of judgment, but I don't want you to miss the hope. God's judgment is a gift that is meant to return to, meant to turn us to repentance. God's judgment is a gift that is meant to lead us to repentance. Repentance is simply a change in direction. That's, that's what the word means is repentance. And Paul, I'm going to have you, uh, can you show us a sign for repentance? Because I caught this the other day, and I love the sign. So everybody look at Paul. Show, come up here, Paul, real quick so everybody can see you. Show us the sign for repentance, if you would. Uh, crush your fingers. This is the letter R. And you have a, your arms crossed like this, and you switch the way to go. Repentance. Repentance. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Give Paul a hand. Appreciate it, Paul. Thank you. I love that sign for repentance because that's what it is. It's changing direction. Repentance is changing direction. And that's what God is calling us to do, to repent, to change direction, to stop following the destroyer and the one who is of destruction and to change direction and start following the son, Jesus. And so I want to say to you, don't waste this moment. Turn to God, pray, ask for forgiveness, step out of darkness into light, pray with the prayer team after church, visit the next page of the website, to learn about baptism or the believer's basic class. And maybe you're here today and you're crushed by fear. You feel like your life is soon to be invaded. Your relationships are crumbling. You're running out of options. Repentance is the goal. Believe it or not, God has set limitations on the intensity and the duration of your suffering. It's time to turn. You must not continue to flirt with hatred and sexual sin. There's a better way. There's a path out of our woe. And it's found by following Jesus. Revelation 9, once we get through all the imagery and and understand what's being said, is designed to bring about repentance. I implore you, do not be like the people living in Egypt. Do not be like the people living in John's day in 90 AD. Do not waste the suffering in your life that's giving you the opportunity to come to God and to repent. We need the Lord. And he will use all means in our lives to show us that. Thankfully, Jesus took the first step towards us, and we remember that when we take Christian communion together. This is open for anyone who believes in Jesus And has accepted him as Lord of their life. And so if you're joining us in the room, you can grab your packet. If you're with us online, go ahead and use what you're going to use to join us in Christian communion. Let's eat together and celebrate Jesus' love and forgiveness. And let's drink together to celebrate Jesus' love and forgiveness. If you're able, would you please stand with your church family? I want to challenge you to allow the words of the song we are about to sing to be your prayer. Repent. Turn. Listen to God who is working to get your attention. See, God loves us too much to just leave us on the path of the destroyer. God loves us too much to just say, ah, to hell with the world. I'm going to go do my own thing and you all do whatever you want. Instead, he allows destruction to come into our lives so that we will turn to him and realize that there is, in fact, a better way. God's judgment is a gift that can lead us to repentance. Let's worship him together. Lord, I come. And I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without 
a lot of truth in those words, right? Whether we have yet to surrender our lives to Jesus and accept his gift of salvation and forgiveness, you know, we need him for that, but we also need him as those who have accepted him to continually mold us into the image of Jesus, right? And that, that passage in Galatians about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, everybody's got that mastered, right? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> um, so, this next song that we have been, that we're going to sing, it's been in my heart for a few weeks now, and uh, for those of us who have uh, accepted Jesus and call him Lord, you know, once we realize that, uh, the, the depth of which we've been saved, you know, uh, the only appropriate response is thanksgiving and celebration, and so uh, this next song is a hymn, it's been around, uh, first showed up at the camp meetings in the 1850s, and so I'm hoping most of you know it, but if you don't, uh, sing along with me when you catch it, so... i 
have a seat. What a great way to uh, finish off service today. That was awesome. That was really good. That was awesome. Awesome. Uh, we're really glad that you're here with us. Uh, whether you joined us online or in person, we are so glad that you have joined us. Um, I want to say thank you again um, for being such good stewards of the resources that God has provided to you. Uh, your faithful giving does the, helps the ministry work that we're doing here at BCC. It helps many of our mission partners. Uh, the reason that we're able to serve the community and do things with Block Ministry or with Young Life or to help with Western Hills Church of Christ in a few weeks is because of your faithful and generous giving. So I want to say again, thank you for being such generous and faithful givers. Um, if you'd like to give today, um, the drop boxes are available in the back. You can give through the uh, website or on the app. Um, and we just want to thank you again. Uh, any other upcoming events that are happening? Uh, the information's on your seat sheet, which you may or may not have sat on when you came in this morning, but it's, it's there somewhere on your seat. Um, and all that information is available on the next uh, tab on the website as well. Um, as we leave this week, uh, something that struck me about Nathan's message today was this. Uh, and it's not, a, it's not a truth we always want to hear either, but, you know, every trial is an opportunity to grow closer to God. Um, I, I'm sure in a room this size, there are more than one person going through some significant trial in life right now. Uh, I've had my own fair share in my life as well, and I know we all can experience and relate and empathize with that. But I want to challenge you to remember that. Whatever you're going through right now, or if it's not now, when it comes again next time, whatever trial that is, it's an opportunity. I think it's really easy a lot of times to dismiss that and say, this, this, this is really hard and I don't like it. But it's an opportunity to grow closer to God. I'm going to try to challenge myself to remember that too. So I'm going to pray for us and then uh, hopefully see a lot of you downstairs in a little while at uh, Pizza Parfaits and Pals. I think I got it right. So let me pray. Uh, God, thank you for today. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the book of Revelation, as confusing as it can be, as difficult as it is. Thank you. Um, thank you for um, providing it. Thank you for speaking to us through it. Um, Father, I pray that as we live life, as we go through, um, we remember that as we go through difficult things, Father, that number one, you love us. Like that song just said, how, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Um, and that we remember these trials are opportunities to grow closer to you and that we will repent that we will walk away from the things that we are doing that are, are not honoring to you, that are not the way that you would have us live. Father, I pray blessings as we go out into the, week, into the world this week, that we will um, show you to others, that we will live a life that is reflective of Jesus, that we will love our community and invite them into a life-changing relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's do this again next week.